Good evening, everybody, and welcome to We the People. I'm your host, John Ellis. Tonight, We the People meet Gail McLaughlin. Gail, Gail is running for uh, the lieutenant governor position in California. It's an interesting role. We don't really hear much about the lieutenant governorship of anywhere, but this particular role has a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of things you can do. I didn't realize that, but our conversation with Adriel Hampton the other day uh, really uh, opened our minds to this, and I'm excited to talk to Gail about what she plans on doing in the role of lieutenant governor of California. So let's welcome her to the show. Gail, thank you for joining us today on We the People. Oh, thank you, John. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Awesome. Awesome. And as always, everybody, we have the lovely Laura Live and Good, who will be here to answer your questions a couple of times. We'll stop and break. Laura, thank you always for doing that. It is my pleasure to be here. And just a reminder, everyone, either tag me or write the word question, one or the other, not both, if you have a question, and we will see what we can get to from Gail. But do listen to the basic um, conversation first, because I bet that she'll cover a lot of things right off of that. Thank you. Yes. And we do have a lot of stuff to talk about with Gail, because... Just so I've been having a conversation with Gail in the green room when we talked earlier today, everybody. And hi, John and Lynn, how you doing? And Louise and Al and Jonathan, welcome everybody. Welcome. So Gail is a burner. Can I say that? Would that qualify? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> I am a burner. <laughs> Gail, Gail's a burner and has a lot to do with the progressive movement. And uh, you've you've been a you've been a mayor. You ran. For, you were a mayor. And before we even talk about the tele governor and and why you decided that, tell us about being a mayor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, let me start out by saying that I I was not only mayor, but I also was the first corporate free council member in Richmond. And then the first corporate free mayor ran two terms in, as mayor until I uh, termed out and then ran for council again and served a couple uh, a couple of years until wow. I decided to go on to this race. So I'm working full time on this race now. But it's, uh, you know, Richmond is a, a, a town that uh, before this alliance that I'm a part of came about, it's called the Richmond Progressive Alliance. Yeah. And it's an organization in our city that, that runs corporate free candidates for local office. Um, and before the RPA, the Richmond Progressive Alliance, Richmond was a company town because we have this major oil refinery in our city, uh, the Chevron refinery. And it's... Uh, you know, it's been polluting our community for a hundred years. And previous to the RPA, all the council members were either um, purchased by Chevron or they were intimidated by the oil giant or they, they were just basically not wanting to mess, you know, make any waves with this uh, big refinery. And uh, we had a lot of poverty, a lot of crime, a lot of health problems, and things weren't getting any better. So we were a bunch of activists in the city. We came together based on our progressive values. And we said, you know, enough is enough. We're going to become the leaders we're waiting for so that we could be sitting at the dais and making the decisions on behalf of the people. And so that's when I ran for council and I won, um, you know, without any corporate money. And then I uh, decided to run for mayor, won that race and was reelected all without any corporate money. And, you know, I wasn't the only one. At this point in time, Richmond has five corporate free council seats out of seven. That's a super majority. So from 2003, when we started, yeah, to 20, to 2017, you know, it took a, a lot of work to get there. But now we, you know, we really have that, uh, that local political power. And we've made many, many accomplishments. And I could share some if you want at some point. Damn, that Damn, was fantastic. That was fantastic. <laughs> uh, and, and quite, quite an open. You know what we didn't do, Gail, was I forgot to talk about headphones. So John, we'll you guys have to on your audio. Yeah, I'm seeing that. Yeah. And uh, that is not coming for me. That's that's uh, That should knock out in a minute. That's on Gail's end because we didn't test headphones. That's totally my oh, fault. Yeah. That's all right. You, we should be okay now. We're fine. Okay. Right? <laughs> We're good. Okay. It's the real moment there. Yeah, that's Hangouts. Google Hangouts has a feature in it that's supposed to kick in and take care of that, and it just did. So we're all good. Thank you. And, and, and yeah, it stopped a moment, but that's okay because I just want everybody to understand. I asked Gail one question, and she covered, like, a multitude of things in one shot. That's, mm -hmm. that's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, was, yeah. You've done this before. You, you know. Yes, yeah. I give a lot of presentations about our work in the RPA and, you know, our accomplishments. And 
um, you know, like, for example, you know, in addition to having won five out of seven of the current city council seats without any corporate money, we won the first new rent control law in California in 30 years this past November. Wow. So, wow. you know, we've been doing firsts for a long time. We reduced crime by seven. We reduced crime dramatically. We re reduced homicides by 75 percent in the eight years I was mayor. Um, we reduced, uh, we, we beat Chevron on our electoral field. Uh, they spent three and a half million dollars to try and defeat me and a couple of other RPA progressives in 2014. That's the year Bernie came to Richmond and endorsed me and my two colleagues. And, and we all won, you know, all the progressives won and all Chevron's candidates lost. So, um, yeah, we've, we've done a lot. I mean, there's, you know, we got $114 million in additional taxes from Chevron. We're a part of a community choice aggregation where 85% of our residents get their electricity from cleaner, greener, and less expensive sources of energy. Huh. So um, these are just a few of the things. Wow. That we yeah. Well, congratulations. That's a lot. And and I just, just want to show everybody we were looking at at the, I don't know if you saw the slide when I when I ran it through. Is this the back? Is this the town? Like we're looking at the website for Richmond Progressive Alliance. Is that those are those are oil yep. tanks, right? And also Chevron's oil tanks in the background there. Yes. Wow. Yeah. It reminds me of Carteret, yeah. New Jersey. That I, it's, I have relatives yeah. out there. Same way. It's just a massive Chevron. Major, major oil refiner. It's the most productive in California. Multi-billion dollar. Um, operation so we we think uh chevron should be paying more in their taxes but it was a big victory for us to get that 114 million dollars in additional taxes and it took community pressure it took those of us who um were clear of our corporate free status and clear of standing for the people who were sitting at the dais um i was mayor at the time you know it was clear that we and the community were united in um, really putting pressure on this uh, oil giant to come to the table and negotiate uh, this tax settlement. So, you know, that's, that's what it takes. It takes community and uh, elected officials who put people first and separate themselves from the corporations um, to really make the policies that are needed. We see too many of the opposite, you know, but right. in Richmond, We've shown a, a really a good model, and and we hope others, you know, take notice and you know, take what they what they find useful and do similarly because you know it's needed everywhere. Well, and and I just I had no idea that you had done you had made that much progress against Chevron in California, yeah. which is crazy, right? Mm -hmm. And we could talk. Absolutely. I want I want to I want to so put, congratulations. That's like some huge progressive <laughs> movement, right? It is really is. We've gotten that reputation all throughout Northern California. Now I'm getting known in Southern California, but uh, we're suing Chevron now, the first time ever Yay. at the city of Richmond. <laughs> Good. For damages to our community, harm, the pollution, the fires, the incidents over the years. Um, so we had a major fire in 2012 that sent 15,000 people to local hospitals for wow. respiratory problems. So we knew, um, and even then, some of the council members who were not the progressives were resisting um, suing Chevron, but we, we made it clear that, you know, this is what we have to do, and we're glad to be, uh, you know, taking them to court now. So hopefully get a, a, another big settlement from them. That's, that's, please do. That's awesome. And, I, and I, it couldn't come at a better time. I want to shift just a little bit to uh, uh, climate. But before I do... <laughs> Uh, you, are you seeing this, Laura? Live and good. I know you want to come in with it with a question. I see you raise your hand. We're going to come in with yeah. that question because I, I just want to hit what Jim Lockett said here. We were we were we were talking about you and that you were a teacher and and that you know you kind of had this nice when we talked earlier. You had this great teacher kind of I could, I could sense it right teacher kind of attitude yeah. kind of calm. Yeah. But Jim says uh, uh, she's a badass and <laughs> kills a complete badass. <laughs> good. See, we bring it out. So um. I just. Teachers can yeah, be badasses too, uh, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm firm. I, I have a kind attitude toward people. I think we all should, you know, that inclusive, um, you know, welcoming and accessible attitude. But you know, I'm unshakable in my values, and people know that. That's excellent. Thank you so much for that, Laura. Live and good. What do we have? Well, I've got a question about climate change. I know you're going to go to that next, but I yes. have a question about what does a town that 
gets that kind of tax revenue from a refinery like Chevron, how do you balance that with wanting to put Chevron pretty much out of business and uh, not be refining anymore? That uh, has got to be a really tough, a tough choice because that's the economy of the town. And yet it's what's destroying the town. I, I know I have a friend who was affected by those fires in 2012 and it got her involved and you know her in the local city council and she's quite active. So, uh, so just maybe speak to that, the dichotomy that you find yourself there. Yeah. Well, you know, first of all, Chevron is here in our city. It is not going away anytime soon. We want it to, we want to shift away from fossil fuels. And we say that over and over again, and we expect them to run a clean, safe, refinery in the meantime and they've gotten many fines because of that fire and they have to replace equipment 20 20 million dollars worth of equipment they have to replace um so our community suffers as a result of it being here and they're they have all their infrastructure here they've got a great location on the san francisco bay they're not going to move um right away. So we need to get our fair share of taxes while they're here. Mm -hmm. And we need to keep pushing them to, you know, to, first of all, reduce their emissions and get that safe, safest, cleanest refinery in place, but also to start transitioning to renewables. You know, if they want to, they can, they can transition and build a different kind of an operation. Um, and they need to train their workers to shift into the new renewable jobs. We don't mm -hmm. want the workers there to to have to um, be without jobs. So yeah, it's been it's been pretty clear that we want to shift to a renewable energy future um, in Richmond. And uh, Chevron, of course, is a is a big bully that is resisting that. But um, we have a major climate action plan in Richmond, and uh, you know we are pushing them to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Right now, they have the highest, they are the, the uh, highest greenhouse gas emitter of a single source in the mm. state of California. So, you know, it's the, we're dealing with the Air Board and Jerry Brown's approach to, because mm -hmm. not regulated, the right. greenhouse gas emissions aren't regulated by the city, except when they want a new project and we could put, you know, conditions on mm -hmm. a new project, which we have in the past. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, we have to we have to transition, and that's that's a, a real a real fact. And in the meantime, as long as they're here, they ought to do do right by the community. That's a good answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that question, Laura. And uh, so uh, we're just going to keep on that line uh, because I want to know about Jerry Brown and his his insistence. A lot of people are starting to wake up to climate change. Let's put it this way. But a lot of people are just saying, great, let's start making some incremental changes in that direction. I'm more of a, we've got maybe five, 10 years max to, to stop this thing or we're toast. Where do you sit in that scale of, oh crap versus eh? Yeah, no, we don't have any time to waste. I mean, our future, our children's future, our grandchildren's future is what it is what's at stake here. And I think Jerry Brown isn't doing right in many ways. He's not come out against fracking. I mean, my understanding is he's he's okay with it. Um, and that, of course, um, you know, totally destroys our, our water and it, it, uh, it adds to the uh, increase in earthquakes. So we know that fracking is something that just has to stop. We also know that Jerry Brown is put a new law into place called, um, it's a renewed law, the cap and trade um, bill, which is really just allowing these refineries to trade pollution credits. They could they could do some you know planting of trees somewhere else in the world and continue to pollute, pollute in the cities where the refineries exist. Right. And Jerry Brown uh, renewed that program. And not only did he renew it, but he um, made it worse by taking the power away from reducing emissions from the regional airboards. And we have made a lot of progress with the airboards in terms of 
capping their emissions and, and then, you know, with goals of going down further. So um, he hasn't been a help at all. And, yeah. and we do need to, we need to do two things. We need to move as swiftly as possible to overcome climate change. And we also have to protect the communities that are living around refineries that are on the fence line in the meantime. So, um, you know, it's, Breathing in the, these toxins day in and day out, especially for people with, you know, vulnerabilities, asthma, elderly children. Um, R- Richmond has among the highest rates of asthma in the state. Wow. So we're we're wanting, you know, both aspects. We're wanting um, healthier situation now um, at in our city with this big refinery, and we want to shift to renewables ASAP. Excellent, excellent. That's good to know. And and uh, I mean, it's 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 pretty frightening when you see uh, where we. I mean, look at where the climate is right now. What's going on with multiple hurricanes, and we don't know where, what's going to happen. It looks like Puerto Rico is going to get destroyed again. They're not even recovering from uh, the last hurricane, right? This takes a massive toll on on uh, uh, on, on all of us. You know, it it it, it just. You're in California. California is like Hollywood and a big center for media. How, where, where, when, how can the state, this is, I'm, I'm all about states' rights at this point, because as I learned about government, Bernie brought me into government in 2015 when I, I woke up, right? Uh, and, you know, you've obviously been going for a lot longer, so thank you for being awake. But uh, how do we hold mainstream media, how do we hold media accountable at a state level? We can't change the federal laws. What do we do at a state level? So for mainstream media? Yeah, because they're not talking about the climate narrative. They continue to bring in deniers, right? Uh-huh. Right, right. Well, I think, first of all, I mean, I'm not sure how we hold mainstream media accountable except to have people get on mainstream media and speak the truth. You know, as a candidate for lieutenant governor, I it gives you an opportunity to have a larger stage, to have a, a, a louder megaphone, and to get on some of these um these mainstream media stations as I was on as mayor. I mean, I, I was actually on many um, national uh, stations and of course, local, regional and statewide media. But um, I think what we have to do is also have more um, alternative media, like, like what you're doing here. <laughs> and we have KPFA in, um, in the Richmond Berkeley area. You know, we, we really need to, uh, expand upon that and i think people so much appreciate having these alternative medias because they get so sick of hearing uh you know the the lies the distortions the omissions and the repetition of the same platitudes that aren't really giving any real meat to anything so we have to we have to do more uh and get we have to get on the main, mainstream and we have to do more alternative uh, wonderful agreed agreed i i, I would hope that uh, at a state level, I would wonder if at a state level you could enact something like the fairness doctrine and force media to cover things in a more balanced fashion. I don't know if that's possible, but that would be nice. I think. Absolutely. Well, I will definitely champion that. You know, I mean, the, the <laughs> lieutenant governor gives gives um, you know gives me the if I win that seat, and even as a candidate, I have the opportunity to champion many many issues, and I have many that I already have, but. As I go to present and talk about, um, you know, the various things I'm talking about, which is mainly encouraging people to organize in their communities, in their regions, yeah. like the RPA did. But I'm also raising up the statewide issues and asking people what their issues are and what they feel are is important. And you know, when you just raise this issue, it it gives me um, an opportunity to expand on the issues that I'm raising. So that's it's an interactive thing that um, I believe representatives and candidates who want to be representatives should um do with the community and with the um constituents nice you almost sound like you actually want to represent the people it's really strange (laughs) absolutely there's no other reason to run and as far as i'm concerned i never had any aspirations to run for city council for mayor except to keep doing organizing to make space for the community to empower itself and to help represent um the, the community's needs, the people's needs, rather than um, having the corporations dominate the scene as they have for, for decades. And, you know, we saw how Bernie talked about how we need to unite and really from the bottom up 
build a movement. And, you know, when he came to Richmond, this was before he even um, decided to run for president. He um, he was talking about that and he he put the um, he really shed a light on Richmond's work, saying this is the kind of organization, the RPA, that other cities should build. And if Richmond could beat Chevron, um, you know, we will give hope to other cities. And of course we did. Um, that was the year they spent, Chevron spent three and a half million dollars to try and defeat us. So um, it's kind of this organizing effort is what I'm continuing to do. It's why I got into office. It's why I continued in office. And it's why I'm um, putting forward this statewide effort. It's, it's all about building that movement, continuing the momentum that uh, Bernie always talked about. That's incredible because it sounds to me like you've been massively successful at it already. And now with the Bernie movement, uh, just kind of riding that wave, uh, I wish you great success. We're going to talk about what the lieutenant governor does because nobody really knows in a minute and why it's a great position to be in. But first, Laura Livengood, I think, has a question, right, Laura? Yes, I've got a couple before you get too too far away. We're talking about the um, lawsuit. Um well uh, Jingy wants to know if you, your legal team is, is exploring the litigation as an ADA case. People who've been disabled by byproducts of a chemical release gives your case a lot of weight, I think, is what he means. Yeah, well, absolutely. People that were disabled were really outraged. All our community was outraged. I mean, BART, our public transit, stopped running into Richmond. AC okay. Transit, our buses stopped running. People could not get home. To Richmond from where they were working and people who worked in Richmond couldn't get out of Richmond and a lot of those people were disabled people and you know it was it was really a horrendous traumatic experience mm -hmm. so yes we're raising that issue we have a wonderful legal team and uh, we're raising the issue of how it harmed and how it presents uh, a real real uh, horror for us all that we have mm -hmm. this risk you know, they, the sirens go off in Richmond once a week to test. It's a test siren. Mm -hmm. And I know, Laura, you live in Richmond, so um, you... Well, I don't, I don't you, live in Richmond. I, I live in Santa Cruz, but I, oh, okay. I'm, so very familiar, I'm very familiar with the Richmond area, though. Okay, so we the siren goes off as a test. So we're yeah. reminded every Wednesday of the, uh, you know, terrible situation that could happen and that has happened in the past. So with the lawsuit, we hope to... Um, not, I mean, the main reason is to assure that this kind of situation that happened in 2012 never mm -hmm. happens again. Yeah. But we also think we deserve compensation. So, are, but are you using the ADA defense in the litigation, though? Is that, are you bringing you know, that up? We're, I, th I know our lawyers have talked about the, the most vulnerable uh, aspects of our community are in most, you know, our, our, Pre presented with the greatest challenge when these mm -hmm. terrible incidents occur. Right. So I can, you know, in terms of utilizing the ADA issue um, as kind of a uh, focal point, I would say it's part of it. There's many parts to this lawsuit in terms of what yeah. um, what we're raising. He mentioned that there's an act or something that, that passed in 2008 that made that a lot stronger. So um, maybe awesome. I'll have him pursue that with you, yeah. like on social media or something like that. That's a question. Please, yeah. um, the other one was uh, Jim Lockett had a question. Will Gail fight to keep the fuel tax off of electric vehicles? Well, I California think wants to put a mileage tax instead of a fuel tax, I think is yeah. the point. Absolutely. I mean, I definitely think that people should be. Um, rewarded rather than um, penalized for moving to electric vehicles. And of course, we want those electric vehicles to go down in price so the average person can can um, can afford it. Mm -hmm. And we need those electric uh, um, plug-in stations, those stations, charging yeah. all over the state, all over the country. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't have nearly enough right now. So yes, I, I really don't think people should be penalized for getting electric cars. Yeah, I don't think so. Oh, I just want to give a shout out to our viewer, Zechariah Wilburn, who is listening to the show and driving past Richmond, oh. past the refineries. And okay. so shout out to Zechariah. And he says, and his windows are rolled up. Okay. All as right. they always well, are well, when he goes to Richmond. That's right. That's right. Yeah, we uh, we know that uh, there's a lot more work to do. We have, we have gotten a lot of uh, controls in terms of flaring. Flaring is this kind of situation they're only supposed to do in emergencies. But in the past, Chevron has 
flared frequently to get rid of um, certain toxins and that makes it even more harmful. So we put some, um, some strong, the Air Board has put some strong regulations on that. So, you know, we, we've come a ways, but we have a lot further to go. Yeah. Awesome. Any other questions, Laura? Well, um, I, this might be something that you're going to bring up later, but I just know I know that immigration is an enormous issue in California. And I do, if that's not something that you were going to talk about, I might suggest that, that people are interested to hear about that. Oh, no, we're definitely going to talk about immigration. We okay. can move into that right now. If you want, that's fine by me. Thank you yeah. for the good questions, everybody. Larry. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, we have, uh, Richmond is a sanctuary city. We have 40% of our residents are Latinos, 27% are African-American, 16% are Asian-American, the rest are white or there's some Native Americans, some Pacific Islanders. But you can see we're a majority people of color community. Mm -hmm. uh, we're a population of 110,000. So with our 40% um, Latinos, and of course there's uh, other nationalities as well that are immigrants. Uh, it's one out of three of Richmond residents are immigrants that were that were foreign born. Some of them may be citizens at this point, but there are a lot of um, residents that are not. So we have worked very hard to protect our immigrant community. We are a sanctuary city that we reinforced throughout all the years I was mayor. Um, we did have some ICE raids in early 20. 07, the first year I was mayor and first, in fact, I think it was the first week, certainly the first month that I was mayor, ICE came in and did raid. They were doing raids all across the country, but they did some in Richmond and we immediately started organizing the community. They started organizing themselves. I went to Washington DC and testified um, before Congress about how our community is being traumatized. And over and over again, we just did things to show our community that the trust of the city council and the residents is what we wanted and what we were securing. We have a municipal ID for all residents, including those um, that are immigrants, that so they could have whatever kind of services they need. We uh, stopped cool. driver's license checkpoints. Nice. So. Um, you know, so there were just many things, and it's a, we feel very strongly about that. We, we really know how much our immigrant community adds to our community at large. That's, that's fantastic. I, uh, that's, that's, that's good to know. So when you said the ice raids, was this this year, or were you talking, you said 2007, was it 07? It was, it was 2007. 2007 wow. was the first year I was mayor. So we really, um, we really jumped right on it, and we had already been working. I'd already been working with the uh, immigrant community in Richmond even before that. Um, we have some really great activists in Richmond that are uh, very strongly con connected to our immigrant community. And people became, no, people understood that that was a, a strong priority of mine throughout the years and before that I was in elected office in Richmond. That's, so, that's incredible. Well, Sanctuary state as well. Well, yeah, in yeah Cal California is, you know, I mean, California would have a hard time right now being anything but because I think, right. <laughs> I mean, the majority of the citizens there are, are people of color. It, it's, you know, it's so obvious. I, I lived in, in the L.A. area for 10 years. You know, I, I know these things. So uh, I, I, I want to move on and talk about about uh, a little bit about um, what the lieutenant governor does. And, and, and we'll come circle back around to immigration. But I want to show everybody something about climate that I forgot to show. You know, you're having an effect. <laughs> against the big corporation when they're willing to put up a billboard about you and try to smear you. Right, That's right. Carol? That's right. That, that billboard that you're showing is uh, in the 2014 election. Um, I, in, in 2013, I went to Ecuador at the invitation of the Ecuadorian president to view the contamination of the Ecuadorian rainforest that, um, Chevron is responsible for uh, for cleaning up and that the indigenous community has sued Chevron over and won billions of dollars. Of course, Chevron took it to appeals and is uh, not paying that, although the, the legal actions keep on going. But um, I went there, I saw the contamination, put my hand in the, you know, the pits with all this, you know, horrible molasses like oil. Um, that has really damaged so many lives and health of so many people in the rainforest and they've had to move their homes 
and of course damaged our rainforest, which is like the lungs of the world in so many ways. So Chevron wasn't too pleased that I went and built solidarity with the community of Ecuador saying, hey, Ecuadorians, um, you know, I know you're suing Chevron. We are too for damages yeah. to our community. Nice. And so I was there to build solidarity. And I, like I said, the, the president, the government of Ecuador invited me and they paid for it. So there were no city tax, city money involved, but Chevron was still going to try and tell the community misinformation that I was spending money and going globe trotting all over. They were trying to portray me as you know, someone who was spending so much time overseas, when that was not the case. Other, every other council member spent more time on trips than I did as mayor. And we've had researchers, really? uh, yes, we had our uh, journalists and uh, UC Berkeley research this. And you know, I was clear that the community knew I was very much a present community involved mayor. So it was kind of laughable, but uh, nice. you know, that's, nice. that's what they do when they want to stop you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's yeah. nice that you had commanded the narrative there, it sounds like. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Very cool. So they, they bought up, that was just one billboard. They bought up every single billboard in the city, except for, I think, three or four. We managed to get those three or four <laughs> to put up our candidates. But they, you know, it was, and they even went as far as Berkeley to put up um, billboards so people could see them from the freeway. So people would, um, you know, when they were driving, if they were from Richmond, they would see these and, and they thought, you know, that people would pay attention and, and not vote for me. But the exact opposite happened. So yeah. I was, I came at number one of the three of, um, there were three council seats open that year. I was, I had termed out as mayor running for council. Um, I won the top spot uh, nice. in the county. So, you know, it takes years of building those relationships, but it can be done. So in spite of millions from a, a giant uh, oil refinery. <laughs> nice. Nice. So that, that's incredible. They bought that's a lot of money on billboards. That's a <laughs> yeah, well, there was other things as well. But billboards was certainly one of the things they were spending their money on. <laughs> Wow. Wow. So, so let's just get this. So tell us what the lieutenant governor actually does and then tell us what you actually want to do with the job when you get there. Thank you very much, John. So first of all, the lieutenant governor is a position um, that it's separate from the governor. You don't run on the same ticket, you know, like a president, vice president. Hmm. Um, oftentimes, the and most of the time, I think in the past, they have been um, di either different parties or really different um, visions for the state. So hmm. I'm running separately with my own vision, which I believe is the vision that Bernie put forward and all the local, our revolution groups are, are standing for and organizing around. So um, what, what the Lieutenant Governor does in terms of the tasks, uh, he or she uh, breaks a tie, is, is the he or she is the president of the state Senate. Okay. And, um, they only have a vote when there's a tie. They break the tie. Okay. So it would be, you know, I would be a tiebreaker if needed. Um, also, the lieutenant governor serves on the state lands commission, which is a very, very important commission because, you know, state land is where oil extraction happens and, and many other <laughs> dangerous things that we want to stop. So I would be sitting on that board. It also sits on the UC Board of Regents and the California State University Board of Trustees. Right. And I plan to organize students um, to hear what their needs are. Of course, Free College California, so I can use the bully pulpit from that, from those boards nice. um, and have the students join me in um calling for this um, free, co free college and ending debt and all that. Um, and there's other things like at the uh, Economic Development Commission that the Lieutenant Governor sits on. And I plan to advocate for a state public bank from that commission, but also for affordable housing and you know truly affordable housing. Put, uh, give tax incentives for low, really low affordable housing and, and raise the taxes on luxury developments, you know. That's one way to really assure that we have the kind of um, housing we need and ending homelessness. And, you know, so economic development in the way that helps the people and in particular those in most need um, is one thing that I will be paying a lot of attention to. Um, but the main thing I'll be, and this is, I mean, it dovetails with all this. Sure. This campaign and my campaign um, 
for le- lieutenant governor. And then when I win, because I am running to win, yeah. I will continue <laughs> the effort in this way. It's really an organizing campaign. Um, I'm going, I visited already about 50 cities in California, meeting with OR groups and meeting with other progressive groups and encouraging them to do as the RPA has done, build that local political power without any corporate money, step up, run for local office and telling them you can do it. You know, you don't need to be a government expert. You just need to be, you know, collaborative and you need to have principles and and have some courage and step up to the plate and you need to build an organization and mm-hmm. this organization could come from people of different political parties that's how we did it in richmond some were greens some were progressive democrats some had no party affiliation so i'm encouraging these progressive alliances throughout the um throughout the state, many have already popped up and talking to the OR groups. And so um, once I'm elected, I will be working to help network these groups together and to utilize the the position of Lieutenant Governor to continue the organizing so we can get those um, statewide issues in place that we need. Like, um, let me just add, here, you know, we need, I mentioned single payer Medicare for all. Yeah. We have a statewide yeah. issue, a statewide bill that was just shelved by a corporate funded elected official. That's what happens when you have corporate funded elected officials in office. They say one thing and then when the bill comes before them, they shelve it. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I'm also, as I mentioned, Free, Cal- uh, Free College California, banning fracking. And then some of the um, ways we get the money are by reforming Prop 13, which is um, a way that in California, we it's supposed to be used to help um, seniors and working people have, keep their property taxes low. But corporations have, have really you know, taken advantage of it. So we have to close the corporate loophole and get corporations to pay more taxes. We need a, a, a progressive millionaire's tax. We need an extraction tax. Um, as long as we have extraction, and I don't want any more, but we should be getting some money because California is the only major oil producing state with no um, extraction tax. And we could get money for this and then each year raise the tax to discourage, to get them out of the operating of extraction and definitely ban new extraction. And then use that tax money to promote renewables throughout the state. We could solarize the whole state, give rebates to every homeowner to solarize their rooftops and uh, put our people to work. So those are just a few of the um, things that I'm promoting. And if we have that network of progressive organizations, we'll have the people power to put the pressure on the legislature to do the right thing and get them implemented. Wow. So Fantastic. that's what Fantastic. I could make of the lieutenant's governor position. I could make it an organizing campaign, uh, organizing position, and work side by side with the community as I did in Richmond. It's a work. It's a model that works. We got so much of a transformation to happen in Richmond because of our working together, um, and I think we can do the same on a statewide level. That's awesome. That's awesome. We will get to Laura Livengood's question in a second, but I want to show everybody something because you mentioned, and the echo will go, our revolution. Uh, and we both talked a little about our revolution earlier. And I just want everybody to see this. Uh, Gail is, is sponsored by or endorsed by at least 12 on this page. She says there are more uh, in the works. Uh, our revolution individual groups, including Mountain View, and be NorCal for our revolution. Uh, that's pretty huge. Uh, and and you've also got an endorsement by somebody in Vermont, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, you're right about 12 and more coming ORs, including San Francisco, Mountain View, Long Beach, um, so many others. And you mentioned um, the, uh, the lieutenant governor that I was endorsed by, and that's, or you mentioned a Vermont endorsement yeah. that I received. And that's from the Lieutenant Governor of Vermont. His name is David Zuckerman. He's a longtime Bernie supporter, worked on Bernie's first campaigns or his early campaigns before he um, became a senator. And uh, he 
ran as an independent this past November for Lieutenant Governor. He had been in the Assembly and the Senate before. A wonderful person. He came to Richmond recently and did a workshop with me at a local, uh, at a, actually it was an international conference held at, in Richmond called Soil Not Oil. And uh, David, you know, was very articulate, very supportive of our work in Richmond, did a fundraiser with me for my campaign the next day and uh, endorsed me. And I, I'm just very honored to have his support. Bernie called him the most progressive lieutenant governor in the country. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope to be working right with him as the second the second lieutenant, independent lieutenant governor in the country when I'm elected. So oh, I'm very, oh, very, very pleased to have met him. Thank you. That, that's awesome. That's really, uh, you know, if he's got and Bernie's endorsement. Uh, that's phenomenal. And I'm, I expect you will at some point down the road as well. But, you know, yes, I, I very much hope to. I, I've been, you know, like I said, getting all these local OR um, endorsements and already have my application in with the national OR and and yes. Bernie is, you know, right in touch with all these groups. Well, and I just want to tell everybody, and you know, we've had this conversation before, and then Laura Live and Good, you're next, but uh, mm -hmm. I've had conversations too with the local groups and the, and the nationals, and they all say the same thing. If you want to get an endorsement at the national level, it, you rack up the local endorsements, and when they see that enough local groups are like, yep, this is who we want, then that's how it works, right? That's how it should work too. Yeah, yes. I think that's that's well, well organized. I mean, that was a, a, a great structure that, that was put in place by the OR folks who got yes. it going and by Bernie, who whose vision launched it. Exactly. Yes. Yes. All hail Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he did so much for us all. I think he deserves so much, as we all know, deserves so much praise. Well, you know what? He, de he deserves a, a patience award because he's waited a long time. <laughs> <laughs> This is true. This is true. He's got a lot of patience. <laughs> yes. All right, Laura Live and Good, what do we have? Um, well, I was going back to that amazing list of what your job will entail, and it sounds amazing. And is that what is that what Gavin Newsom is doing now? Does he have a similar list or do does he have a different agenda? Is you know, his... I don't I don't see uh, and everyone I talk to doesn't see him doing a whole lot with the position. You know, he sits on these boards. I actually testified before the State Lands Commission recently on, be, uh, on behalf of the community of San Pedro in California, who has these huge, um, dangerous LPG tanks right near residential. And of course, you know, Gavin Newsom sits on the State Lands Commission. So I was testifying before him and telling him, you got to move those tanks. It's not right. The community, if those tanks um, explode, you're going to have a huge um, disaster. I mean, even worse than the Richmond fire. And so I, mm -hmm. I brought my experience forward from the um, Richmond fire experience. And so you know, they, they listened. I didn't, I don't know what they're going to do there, but the community is putting a whole lot of pressure. And I did, you know, I was glad to be a part of that. And I'm, I'm hoping they, they move in the right direction here and don't renew that contract. But um, I would be the one doing the helping do the organizing and standing with the community. You'd be all over that, in other words, so right? Really yeah. And so I don't <laughs> And the community members that, and groups that I've been talking to up and down California are not seeing him as anywhere uh, near the kind of... This is know, a stepping stone for him, right? He's got higher aspirations. Absolutely. It's a stepping stone. And he is running for governor. And yeah. so... Um, they're not, there's, there isn't a support among, for uh, him among the progressive groups I've been talking to. All the OR groups are having many, many um, concerns about him. So um, hmm. I don't think he's made use of that position at all. I think he's, he's given a few words here and there, and then he's basically um, sat on the sidelines. Um, there, there is another um, uh, role that the lieutenant governor has. The lieutenant governor is acting governor when the governor is out of town. So <laughs> there is that role. And um, I say, you, you know, you can undo bills or put in new bills. <laughs> <laughs> just, while you were away, I... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, but uh, yeah. So anyway, that's... Um, and of course, if something happens to the governor, the, the lieutenant governor would, would take over um, uh, as governor at that point. So um, yeah, I, I'm prepared for... for the kind of work that that I want to put into this, and I don't think others have have done so in the past. Um, yeah, time for a change, and time for a woman in that office too. 
Yeah. We've never had a woman uh, lieutenant governor nor a corporate free one. So, you right. know, Excellent. stepping out here. Nice. <laughs> Any other questions, Laura? I'm good. Well, the other thing we talked about before, and I don't, don't, and forgive me if it was mentioned because I've been looking at chat, um, that you are running NPP. You are not running as a Green Dem or, or Dem. Right. I um, used to be a Green Party member. I was a Green Party member the whole time I was mayor and, and you know, up until last, um, early last year when I decided to switch from um, Green Party to NPP, no party preference, because in California, of course, NPPs, people registered NPP, can vote um, for a Democrat for president in the primary. And I wanted to vote for Bernie. So I changed my registration to NPP. Um, and then I decided to stay NPP. I still hold those green values close to my heart. Um, I, you know, I, all those social justice and environmental justice and ecological wisdom and all those things that we need to all hold. And I know many progressive Democrats hold them as well. But I decided to stay NPP because um, you could, it's the top two vote getters in California in the primary. So in, it doesn't matter which party or if you have no party, it's just if you make the top two votes that you go on to the general election. So in some ways it's nonpartisan on um, the statewide races. So I mean, only the presidential race in California, you know, Californians have to vote the party in presidential races unless they're NPP and then they could get a shared ballot with the Democrats and other parties. But I guess I think I can enhance my relationships. I already have wonderful relationships with uh, Greens and Peace and Freedom members and progressive Democrats and those with no party affiliation. And I just want to deepen those relationships. Um, and I can do that by standing as an NPP outside of, you know, outside of any party. And um, from there, I, I think, you know, people can get to know me and, and know what I stand for. And that's what's most important. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that. Good question, Laura. And honestly, I think at this point, um, especially with for the with the position in, in this particular one, that running independent or NPP, no party preference is fine, uh, especially with the endorsements you have from a lot of people who are also <laughs> running that way. I mean, it would seem. You yeah. Know. yeah, well, it's great that the OR revolution groups, you know, Nina Turner said it, they will endorse without uh, any without any party or no party. Right. They, their endorsements based on the progressive values of the person. And, um, you know, I want to unite people. I want to unite progressive Democrats and Greens and, and those who have no party preference. But by our values and, and yeah. by our abilities to stand up to these corporations who are ruining our democracy, and they're all over our state capital. I know that much. We have to denounce that over and over again. And nobody is doing it in the state at the statewide level and needs right. to be done. So I'm I'm excited to be taken on this this uh, role as a candidate and, and later I, I hope to take it on as California's lieutenant governor. That's that's awesome. I, I, it's it, you, were, you keep talking about organizing, bringing the groups together. And that, that is to me, that's that's the key. Right. That we, we don't we can't you can't raise the kind of money. You will never be able to raise the kind of money in this race that Gavin already has or these other people. You have to raise people. And that's right. You know. These all donations. People are giving me twenty-seven dollars, like they gave Bernie. Mm -hmm. Right. They called me. <laughs> nice. An article called me the uh, Bernie Sanders of the East Bay, which I, you know, am humbled nice. by, I'm very honored by. But I'm, I'm definitely um, interested in getting those small donations and uh, whatever people can give. It's, it's how we, uh, and it's, it's that unity, as, as you're saying, building that movement. Because one person cannot make the kind of changes that we need in our state, in our country, in our world. It takes that civic mindedness of, of people activated city after city after city so that we, we really have that political power to address those corporations um, that are, you know, just, just really taking us into off a cliff, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, and, and we're kind of in a, you and I talked earlier, we're in a, a race against time with climate change. It's not going to get any better. You know. That's right. Climate change, wealth inequality. I mean, that's getting worse by the day. You know, I mean, what kind of a a, a country is is has the level of homelessness that we have? I mean, California is is just moving further and further with our housing crisis. People more and more on the streets. Well, 
while the wealthy are just, you know, reaping in more and more profits. It's just not fair. And until until we stop those uh, that kind of inequality from growing, we're not going to be able to build the kind of society we need. And, and that's what we all should. We have to. We have to stop the bad stuff and promote the good stuff. And we can do that together. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, uh, yeah, well said. Absolutely. I'm going to ask you one more tough question, and then we're going to let you stump, and then we'll talk about your song, because uh, I just want to let you know you've, you've won award, the Badass Award from the audience. Uh, you've also, Jim Lockett also says you're a deadhead, so what can't be liked, all right? So <laughs> Badass Deadhead Progressive runs for Lieutenant Governor of California. Yeah. Bernie, Bernie of the East Bay. That's good. I guess we'll add that to the list. That was, that was, that was a nice uh, compliment. <laughs> nice. So we're going to take care of this in three minutes. You don't have to go deep into it. I, it's, it's just a, it's close to my my mind right now because of what we're seeing in St. Louis. right? And California's got a unique situation because you've got a lot of people of color as cops in California. You've got no choice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're right, a sanctuary right. city because I think your cops would revolt if you weren't. You know, a sanctuary state. So how do we how do we de-escalate the police? Because it seems right now, from my view, that they're just wholly out of control, and they're and they're allowed to be out of control because our justice system doesn't doesn't prosecute them. What do how do we fix that at a state level? Absolutely, we have to do we have to do something to first of all the the um, the police bill of rights has to be changed and overturned, or you know they should nice. be held far more accountable. Um, in Richmond, we have a police uh, commission, what used to be called the police commission. We now call it the Citizens Police Review Oversight Commission. Hmm. And uh, we have not had a, um, a police shooting uh, that, uh, I don't think we've had any police shooting in a decade, but we did have one in 20. 20- 14 and you know we changed we when that happened we immediately changed well not immediately we had to fight for it uh the police commission ordinance to make it stronger so now it's one of the strongest in the country anytime there is a shooting that ends in death or serious bodily injury an immediate investigation of this commission is begun it doesn't have to wait for any paperwork or whatever it you know the family doesn't have to file anything it just automatically happens so that's a another that's a step that will hold them more accountable um one thing the black lives matter movement of course is a wonderful, wonderful, strong movement in our country. And one thing that um, Richmond has to our credit is our previous police chief, um, a very community involved police chief and who helped change the culture of our police department. It's not 100 percent, you know, perfect by any means, but we did have a really strong community involved police force. We still do because someone took over for the chief nice. that was equally. But um, one thing he did is he was sta- he stood at a Black Lives Matter with me as mayor and our vice mayor holding a Black Lives Matter sign in uniform. And it, it hit the press nationwide. Oh, he got wow. some flack from his officers for that, but he stood for it. We have to make relationships with our community and our largely people of color community deserve to know that our police are not, you know, in our building relationships with them rather than having this hostile attitude or this, you know, knee jerk reaction. So there's a lot that has to be done to to change this, the, this hostility, this, this um, knee jerk, this racism yes. that we have in our in our state, in our in our country. So I'll do everything I can as lieutenant governor to put into place any kind of laws or revisions of laws that hold the police more accountable. That's fantastic. I, I, I didn't even know. I just want to ask you real quick about the, the, the ordinance you're saying, because I didn't even know this was possible. So it's a, it's a community commission that looks into the investigates the issue. What happens if they find wrongdoing? Is there, is there a way for them to enforce consequences? Right. So they, um, they have a hearing officer that, um, you know, conducts the investigation and then puts the information before the commission. And then the commission makes its decision, you know, and its decision is then put before the police chief. And if the commission and the police chief have different uh, outcomes in terms of their rulings, then the, it goes to the city manager. 
Oh. Now, one thing I always thought is it should go to the city council. We weren't able to get it changed to that level, but because we didn't have a super majority or even a majority on the city council at the time. But I believe that you know now we have a, a super majority, and and if the final decision rests with the council and you have a true progressive council, then you can be assured of a better outcome. So that may be something that gets changed in, you know, in the future. So that's incredible. Yeah. I just, everybody in the audience, we talk about this all the time. I didn't realize it was happening in Richmond, but no, what, what you just, what you've described to us, Gail, basically is a full takeover of a town by progressives issue based issue based and that's and that's amazing and you are controlling the town you're manhandling the police you're manhandling chevron i mean manhandling in a not man yeah. way you know what i mean uh, I know. Uh, yes. we've got the, we've got the control we've got local political power yeah that's and that's that's what it takes in every city across this country is that and you've been working at that and i think you would be fantastic at doing that for the state of california that's just great Thank you, John. I really appreciate that. I certainly want to give it my uh, my best as we go forward. Oh, fantastic. All right, you got a few minutes. Stump, tell us why vote for Gail, although you kind of already did, but hit it. Well, yeah, I'll try and summarize. Well, yes, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm very uh, much taking on this race to encourage people to build these local progressive alliances, progressive organizations, whatever you want to call it, bringing together people in the community and running candidates for local office without any corporate money. But it needs to have that organization, and not only during election years, because too many times you build something in election years and then the non-election years, the whole thing dissipates. The RPA, our organization, is a year-in, year-round organization. I mean, in non-election years, you know, we organize around the issues. Um, then we start again the next election year, you know, to either re-elect or get new progressives on board. That permanent structure is needed in every city. So I'm encouraging that everywhere I go. I'm also raising the statewide issues, you know, that I've already mentioned, single payer, free college, no fracking, and all these taxing of corporations that is needed to really help um, the people of our city bring the money, bringing money to cities for affordable housing, and so many other things, you know, defending our school, our public schools against the expansion of charter schools, you know, nice. going against the privatization of prisons, putting money into reentry services, these are the kind of things that will help reverse California's problems, and it'll take us all. And of course, denouncing corporate interference in our government. I mean, our state government, our city governments are just over overrun by these corporations. We have to let people know it's the corporations and those elected officials who do the bidding of the corporations, who are the intermediaries that are causing these problems. We need to have of the people, by the people, and for the people, or else we're doomed. So I'm pushing that message hard. Awesome. That was great. Thank you so much. And I would love to have you back many times because California is a huge state for all of us in this in, in progressive politics, and we've got so many other issues to talk about. Would you come back? I absolutely would, John. Thank you very much. I would... Please keep inviting me. I'll be there. Wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> Laura Live and Good, thank you so much for answering and getting all the questions from the audience today. You are most welcome. And, thank you, Laura. Yeah, and I would encourage anybody who has deep questions um, can probably find you on Facebook, Gail, and ask questions there. Or please, what's, please. The best way, what's the best way, what's best way for people to reach out to you? Okay, so they can email me at Gail, it's G-A-Y-L-E, at galeforcalifornia.org, that's for is F-O-R, and California spelled out, galeforcalifornia.org. My website is galeforcalifornia.org. Sign up to be on my email list. If you can give a donation, you could donate from there. Um, email my uh, email me anytime, I'm very big on email, um, or they can, uh, they can call me. I have a, a, a campaign phone, but I also have a phone in my home here uh, that's like a business-oriented phone. I'll give you that number. It's 510-237-1456. Um, contact me, and I'll do the best I can to, to answer your questions and uh, get our conversations, you know, blossoming further and further throughout California. Awesome. I'm impressed. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. All right. So she just gave you her number, you guys. Yeah, <laughs> she did. So that's pretty good. Now that now we're getting to the real the core of things, what really makes yes. you uh, who you are and, and why we should vote for you. So explain the song choice. We can run Grateful Dead. What's this about? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to you? Sure. Yeah. So I, I have been a long time Grateful Dead fan, you know, from when I was a lot younger in my 20s. And I think they're extraordinary mus musicians. I miss nice. Gary Garcia intensely, but all the Grateful Dead um, are extremely talented mu uh, musicians. And um, we can run, but we can't hide is kind of the theme of this song. And what it is all about is about climate change and is about environmental disaster and we we can run you know we could ignore it but we really can't hide and our our children our grandchildren deserve uh, a sustainable planet they deserve uh, uh, this planet as their home for future you know for the future um, we really don't own this planet you know it belongs to the future generations and the song says that and it says it so beautifully with such heart and such soul that um, I, I decided to choose this one for uh, ending this interview. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's great. I appreciate that. It's, it's uh, nice to hear somebody eloquently explain what, what the song means. And, and you know, uh, I like the Grateful Dead as a musician. This is a typical Dead song, but probably a short one from their library. Uh, it's six <laughs> minutes and 14 seconds. So. Uh, everybody feel uh, enjoy thank you all for being here what a great audience you were thanks everyone great everyone's really happy to be yeah. here. next week everybody we have uh or next week geez tomorrow no wednesday wednesday geez because <laughs> we do double 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 we the people's doug applegate's running in california's 49th district we're going to talk to doug yeah. on wednesday find out what's going on with him and uh thank you laura live and good for all of your effort booking and organizing and making this you happen you're most welcome this and, is not a hard sell uh, no no it's not no <laughs> not for progressives anyway uh and th thank you to everybody out there in our audience because many of you are also volunteers and you're here as part of this group you you make this show happen because uh, we're gonna i'm gonna run credits right here that were made by volunteers to show how many volunteers actually make this show happen and this network run so it's yours thank look you for, for your name on. Yeah, look for your name, <laughs> and then then tell us who we missed because I'm sure we missed. <laughs> if you somebody. don't see us, don't get mad. <laughs> Vote for Gail, everybody, and help her out. Donation link is in the description. Thank you for being on, Gail. Thank you so much, Laura and John. I really appreciate it. Okay, thanks. And this is live, uh, Hampton, Virginia, 1989. Never get far 
Maybe we can run Billions speak with just one voice, saying, Just leave all the rest to me. I need it worse than you, you see. And then I heard the sound of one child Okay. 